So we're here at the CS 2018 and who are you? I'm Paul Gray, Research Director at IHS Market. So what's the latest uh, uh, that you are talking about following in the display industry? Yeah, certainly what we're, what we're seeing is really people building out more and more of the UHD ecosystem and UHD being more than just resolution but about color and frame rate and dynamic range as well as just more pixels. Because uh, uh, now it's, 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 it's nearly impossible to buy uh, full HD anymore. Like if you buy a 55 inch, it's just basically the same price nearly to get a 4K. Yeah, the panel makers have spoken and the panel makers have uh, stopped, ma stopped manufacturing or announced that they will stop manufacturing uh, 4K in, in, in larger sizes, so 55 inch and bigger and by the end of the year 50 inch even. And uh, uh, the, the content is just Netflix and Amazon. It's Where coming. Are getting 4K? It's coming. I think that you have to look at the creation of the content and shooting movie type content offline is relatively easy in 4K. The thing that people really care about is live broadcasts, especially of sports. And there you've got to have eight cameras or more all running simultaneously. You've got to have outside broadcast trucks. You've got to have real time editing and production. And that takes a lot of time and effort investment in expertise and it's very very expensive and, and as a result broadcasters have done a lot of work on developing the production workflows and now we're beginning to see that content appear so um yeah i just switched my nd filter now it looks much better in 4k <laughs> just right now uh, and uh so this uh, there was today there was a uh, hdmi had something about hdmi 2.1 right. and they're talking about dynamic hdr is that a big difference compared to normal HDR? I, I, I think one of the things we've seen is that uh, at first people put in the static metadata that allows accurate reconstruction of the original uh, signal conditions and people then enhance that by saying well you can do better you can add dynamic data so scene by scene even frame by frame uh, data uh, and, and those are enhancements. I think that in the end, what matters most is HDR or no HDR. And HDR, it is completely obvious when you see it. And, and our, our kind of monkey brain just looks at that and says, this is just really real. So uh, I think the, the exact nature of the data, how much data, how you package it, what format it is, is a, a very secondary in performance. So it's not a huge leap to go into dynamic HDR. They're talking about frame by frame, scene by scene. Why is that so important? Uh, um, the reason for doing dynamic is that it allows you to, to use those bits more efficiently. And all the time there, there's very little um, redundant information if you do use dynamic HDR. So th there's a good reason to do it. Um, I think that it's still of secondary importance to just doing HDR regardless of what the format is. But of course everybody wants to sell IP, everybody wants to make money out of it, and therefore we have something that maybe isn't a format war, but certainly some healthy competition and lots of new solutions for HDR. I saw something amazing just before I was lucky at the Sony booth. Yeah. They have an 8K, 10,000 nits. Yes. Uh, that's a big deal, no? I mean, that's like, it felt like going out, outside. Right. I felt like I was woken up. And, and, that, and that, I think, is the thing that you get with HDR, that you suddenly get that moment when you suspend disbelief, and it's like looking at a window with a glass out. Um, and suddenly, it just looks real. Um, and, and that's what it does, and dynamic range is a critical part of that. So, you don't just get an HDR, you don't just get an HDR 10, plus 10, uh, all that stuff, you have to look at nits. Isn't that one of the um, most important parts of uh, the experience? Certainly you have to have a display that can put out those very bright highlights. Um, and, and our view is it's somewhere over 550. Uh, there are lots of different ways of measuring it. 550? 550 I think is yeah. where you start to get that impression that it, uh, of realism, or enhanced realism. But do some TVs have two, three, four thousand and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's about the sparkling highlights, probably not the whole display all the time running at two, three, four thousand. Um, it is, I think, something that there's a lot of learning to be done because we've, we've all gone through this issue with loudness and noise for um, commercials where broadcasters have turned the volume up um, and it becomes painful. And again, 
you can you can think of the scenario where there's a soap bo- soap commercial and it's whiter than white and you get that feeling that you, it's painful to watch because it's too bright. So yeah, it, it totally woke me up. So if I would have that at home, I was just thinking uh, it might not be so good for the brain because you you'll be like if you're watching TV late at night, it's like you're in the middle of the day and you you can't go to sleep. There there are some other interesting ones. I, I don't know any, if anybody's really done research, for example, on um, people who have photosensitive epilepsy. Um, and, and it's something we have to be careful about. And there's a learning curve about doing it. At first, normally people do the kind of jokes with it, if you like, and we'll have high dynamic range gags, just like we had 3D gags. But in due course, the expertise will settle down and people will know how to create good HDR content. But there's a learning curve to go through. And uh, there's so many other things, right? Uh, what do you think about those OLEDs? They're all made by LG. They and are. Every company is using them, but they have different uh, image engines, right? That's right. So the, a, a TV is more than just the panel and that the video processing is of great importance. And people use different video processing solutions. They have their own secret source that they add. Uh, and I think that's part of healthy differentiation. And certainly when you look at uh, OLED sets, they're not all the same. Is Sony the best? Uh, buy what you like. Buy what you like. If you, it, it, just like audio and cars and wine, then buy what you like. If you can't taste taste or see the difference, don't, don't, don't pay for the extra. But one thing I'm wondering, because Hisense, TCL, uh, Skyworth, all these companies, uh, why is it so hard for them to get a little chip that is as good as whatever Sony is doing? Isn't it just a little chip? Um, it's a very accessible technology, and there are very few IC vendors, but people add other things on to enhance it. So people put that into a special um, uh, custom IC, and a lot of people have different understandings of how perception works. So for example, Panasonic has very deep experience in emissive displays from plasma, um, and therefore they do some things differently and they drive the panel differently. Um, Sony has huge amounts of broadcast experience and so they use some of that into, uh, into their TVs. Uh, and I think that creates a healthy and diverse market. But a company like Hisense, for example, I think they're pretty cool. Because, just because I'm looking at the prices sometimes, yep. I see a 65 inch for $7.99, 4K supposedly HDR and stuff, stuff like that. Right. But it might not be a super bright one, I guess. It doesn't have a crazy good HDR. And they only had HDR, one of them, by a firmware update. When they sold it, right. we didn't have it. Later it came out, but it was not quite But the peak, real. The peak light output of a panel, uh, in that case, will, will, be, will be limited. And therefore, you won't get those super sparkling peak, peak whites. When you look at a, a scene, the light in an outdoor scene should be in the sky. Yeah, that's where the sun is. That's where the light for the whole scene comes from, the sky. And that should be brightest. Um, and those sort of displays will not be able to, to do that. Um, when you see real HDR content, then the sky is the brightest thing in the image, and, and you can see that. And it looks more real because you can see that illumination in the image off the sky. But uh, I'm thinking about a company like Hisense. As far as I know, they're pretty big. They yep. have a big factory, yep. and TCL is uh, huge and stuff like that. Indeed. So shouldn't they be able to make an image processor that is on par with whatever the huge brands are doing. I, I think that there's still some gap in experience, but broadly the, the Chinese brands have learned extremely fast. Uh, and I think probably the, uh, the, the issues that they face now are more ones of marketing and how to specify and market a product and do the correct brand and channel management rather than solving the basic engineering problems. That's why Hisense is calling it ULED. Ah, uh, yeah, they, they've got their own... They say it's like OLED, got, but half the price or something. Uh, it's, it's a quantum dot solution. Quantum dot. Yeah, so th- they decided not to go in the QLED alliance, uh, which is Samsung and TCL. Uh, and instead, they said they'd do their own path and so call it ULED. What's the QLED alliance and what's the difference with um, the ULED? So, in terms of technology, nothing. It's a quantum dot LCD display. Um, and it uses quantum dots to give you a broader color gamut. Um, so technically, essentially, it's the same solution, but their marketing choice is about whether you call it QLED, ULED, and how you go to market with that. And is quantum dot totally awesome? Um, I think that a well-executed quantum dot LCD 
with high dynamic range, with a um, full array local dimming, gets very, very close to OLED performance. So, what is this quantum dot? So, a quantum dot is, uh, uh, how to describe it? It is, it is a light conversion material. And you put light of one color in, it excites the dot, and out pops light of another color. Um, what is fascinating, amazing about this technology is that the light that comes out is very, very pure. Um, it's really effectively a single, close to a single frequency. Um, and that gives much stronger excitation in the eye, and therefore you perceive it as a very, very rich, saturated color, and it allows you to do colors that currently um, existing backlights can't resolve. So for example, the really rich bluey greens, um, really, really deep reds, the sort of, you know, burgundy red wine reds that current LCDs can't do. And most uh, conventional LCDs, the, the, the red is a rather rusty orange color, actually. Um, so quantum dots will enable you to have these super pure colors. And uh, it's amazing that LCD always finds some kind of way to stay ahead, right? Uh, or uh, to, uh, to not be uh, totally overtaken by anything. Absolutely, Nikolai. I mean, you know my, uh, my joke about LCDs, which is they're like seagulls. So they're not good at anything, but they're extremely smart and very adaptable. And, and the genius of LCD as a technology is that it's a system. It's an optical stack of um, separate components. So you have a light switching engine, you have a, uh, a light emission engine, and as a result, you can change one of those components without affecting the others. So with an LCD, Want a double the amount of light coming out? Put in a bigger backlight. And, and job done. It's crude, but it works. Um, you want to double the resolution? Change the, um, uh, change the shuttering part of the LCD. Does it affect everything else? No. Then you compare it, for example, to OLED, where every time you want to do that, you have to go back and fundamentally redesign the, the device. Um, OLED is very, very simple. But as a result, if you want to change one thing, you have to change the whole device, and so it takes more time. And uh, there's probably a whole bunch of other potential... I mean, uh, it seems that the OLED guys are quite happy right now, confident. Yeah. It's taken 20 or 30, 40 years. I, there was an anniversary recently. I forgot how much the number was. But uh, it seems that they are feeling uh, they might be taking off I, I think in a whole bunch of areas if you if you look in high-end markets um, then very clearly consumers have decided that OLED is something distinct different unique and special so in Western Europe um, we see OLED really carving out a, uh, a strong position for itself and, and all other features being equal then OLED seems to be the same in consumer's value as another 10 inches of LCD. So 55 inch OLED goes for the same price and consumers are prepared to pay the same amount of money as a 65 inch LCD. All other featuring being the same. In Japan, OLED is now outshipping LCD in 55 inch. Really? Yeah. Outshipping? So more OLEDs ship in 55 inch and bigger than LCDs. Whoa. Now, in Japan is slightly different. That means um, LG has been able to get their price down a little bit? Uh, no, it's not really about pricing. This is about marketing it and a choice of brands. And Sony's done a fantastic job in Japan. Um, and consumers are very receptive to that message. Now, 55 inch in Japan is a big TV and it's a much more premium proposition than it is in, in Europe or especially the US or China, where it's a mainstream size. Um, but even so, the very clearly, in some markets, consumers have taken to heart this message that OLED is something distinct, different, and special. I'm waiting for the day that somehow LG can drop their prices. Oh, yeah, it'd be nice, it'd be wouldn't cool, it? Right? Uh, yeah. Which, I mean, I, mean I, I was. I think there's something happening already after this Christmas. I think everything. If I just, I was just in uh, in Fry's Electronics. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of LG 55-inch uh, stacks. Yeah and it said uh, discount something. So, but it'd be great if they somehow it, have the price it, again. I, I think obviously with, with our consumer hats on as ordinary consumers, then we, we'd, we'd always like to pay less. Um, the reality for OLED is that the rate of um, expansion of manufacturing capacity means that for the next three years at least, then OLED is going to be in shortage. 
and so there is very little commercial need to drastically cut prices. Why would they be in shortage? They can't ramp but up? It's, it's, the, it's about the amount of money you have to spend on building fabs. Didn't they uh, spend already tens of billions yes. or something? They spend, they've spent billions, and you, it's, at that stage, it's a race to be uh, to build capacity and how brave you are. And, and I think in LG Display, then they're very mindful that if they overinvest in capacity, they could break the company. You know, these are serious sums of money that people are talking about. Um, you know, if if your projections aren't right and you owe five billion dollars to the bank, then you've got a problem. Even if you're LG, even if you're LG. Yeah, and in, in all these businesses, these are... Subsidized by the government. No, no, no. These are stupendous amounts of money for these companies to borrow and to finance. And they are, they are being cautious, and I, I can't blame them for that. I, I, I haven't tried to live with an OLED TV at home. I'm wondering if every time you turn on the TV, you're like, Whoa. you just feel like, oh, it's <laughs> so beautiful. Or um, do you get just... Forget about it. Now, that's an interesting question. Do you just get used to it? You know, like French wine and German cars that, you know, once you've tried it, you don't go back. Um, I, I, think, I think that, you know, the difference is many consumers find that noticeable. Um, and it's a richer and more rewarding experience. But the last couple of years, I, I think that the product decisions of, on the LCD TV side have been about following OLED in terms of thinness. Um, and this year, it's very interesting that the industry seems to be going back to fighting OLED in terms of contrast performance, so using full array local dimming. Um, and I think that 2018 is going to see um, you know, the empire fights back <laughs> and, and that we will see LCD products that look very, very good and very, very close to OLED. And the question is, uh, how close do you have to go knowing that LCD is uh, a cheaper, more mature technology, um, and does that start creating uh, more competitive pressure on OLED? One thing that, I don't know if it disappoints me, but when I look at the bit rates that Netflix is streaming yeah. 4K at, uh, many people are only getting 11 megabits, and the maximum they crank out, I saw, I was 15. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how can that be okay? Because isn't that like a little bit sad? They spend billions and billions on content, yeah. and then they compress it so much to save bandwidth. Uh, I, I think they, they compress it to save bandwidth, and that's a pragmatic decision um, as to how to deliver it to people. Um, I would love to know Netflix's compression strategy. Um, the research done by the Forever Project in Europe suggests that resolution is the least visible thing. Um, and if you think about a fast-moving object, if it moves by more than two pixels per frame, then that is no different to 1080p. Yeah, and that's just blur that is caught by the shutter of the camera. So, but, but resolution is very, very heavy on bitrate. And what the Forever Project showed was that the thing that actually people really notice the difference with is dynamic range and then frame rate. Completely the opposite to what the CE industry has done. <laughs> so I think that what Netflix is probably doing is they throttle back the resolution a bit, which nobody can see, um, and they keep those bits for dynamic range and color, which is what you really can see right across the room. So you are definitely getting something much better with that 4K UHD type stream, but not necessarily the full resolution, but most of the time that resolution may not be visible anyway. So when I was seeing 2017, uh, 65 inch, 799, that was yeah. kind of like uh, the basic price for the Hisense, right. TCL, stuff like that. And I'm thinking, okay, after Christmas, maybe they discount some of them. And maybe they, they're just going to stay at 799 but improve the quality maybe for the next generations, right? And that's just amazing to have 65-inch keep improving yeah. at that kind of price. And I, I think that the indications this year at CES are that the industry has decided to fight OLED on quality and that the whole industry is trying to race upwards on quality. That is fantastic news. Um, and if you think about what's going on in content, then Amazon and Netflix are competing by who can offer the best content, shot in the most imaginative way, with the most fantastic technical image quality. Um, the, th 
the rumblings you know, of the earthquake are that in China, people are building lots of generation 10 LCD fabs. There is going to be structural overcapacity in the industry, starting now. Overcapacity? In LCD panel manufacture. Too many. Far too many. Far too many. Far too Even many. if everybody buys a 65 inch now. Uh, everybody would have to buy a 65 inch. But they might, um, they might, might be a good idea, I think. Um, yeah, it's so awesome. consumers have choices, yeah? yeah. Um, and that means that long term we see that LCD panel pricing is going to remain weak. And that is... Weak? For, yeah, so for consumers that is the good news that those TVs will get cheaper. So it's going to get even cheaper? Even cheaper. Yeah, they, you use it even. <laughs> it's crazy because it's yeah. $7.99 for a 65 inch 4K HDR. It, 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 Five years ago, you couldn't have dreamed of that, could you? Um, you couldn't have dreamed of that. Because I was thinking, ah, 55 is going to be plenty enough. Now I'm thinking, I'm not going to go le less than 65. You, you get I used to it. I, I, I think we, we start to get to the interesting point, which is when consumers say, I can't move any more furniture, um, or I, I physically can't get it into my living room anymore, or, or whatever. Um, and that will start to happen country by country, depending on the housing stock and, and what, what sort of size rooms people live in. Maybe sh the TV should be part of a Netflix subscription. And then well, we, the, we can swap out the TV every two well, years. Well, maybe that happens. You know, maybe pe people sell them uh, like mobile phones. Uh, there was, is a company in China that was doing that, which was Le TV. They were and, trading And, and they were giving program? a free TV with a yeah. seven-year subscription. Wow. Um, but it, it needs a lot of cash because you've got, to pay, you've got to give the consumer the TV today and you're going to get your money back over the ne next five, six, seven years, you know, and you've got to be brave and patient. Uh, and it broke Lure TV. They ran out of cash. Is there any chance that they'll all switch to Android TV? Because I don't like all these systems. Um, it's like uh, fragmentation. I, I think we will see consolidation um, and Android is the larger shipping o uh, OS platform. So many apps. Um, it's because the Chinese have gone for it. And 90% of TVs that ship in China have smart functionality, and that is with forked versions of Android. So as a result of China being the biggest TV market and very high penetration of smart, then uh, Android dominates. It's not all Google compliant Android because of China, um, but it is the dominant OS. And TCL is part of the badge, you know, as they're sponsoring. But in the US is Roku, and the U in the Europe they use Android TV. Right. What's up with this Roku thing? Why can't they just switch it all to Android TV? Oh, I think I think Roku is a uh, an excellent approach. It's very very simple, um, and because it's simple, it's very robust. Um, I know that several TV brands have had huge problems with Android because of the number of updates and yeah. literally they have no idea some are uh, still in that version 6 oh, it, it's, it's even eight. worse there are updates <coughs> on a daily basis to Android um, and as a result um, you suddenly discover that functionality stops working I had an Android tablet that suddenly stopped playing video and it took three weeks for Google to fix that um, that's not acceptable with TV um, and I think Roku, as an example, is a far simpler solution. Uh, it's very robust, and um, at, at this stage I'll come clean. I've got a Roku box at home. Um, it's great because it's really simple, and it does what I want to do, which is watch TV. Um, and, it, and it wins the teenager test. So my two mm -hmm. teenage boys, it's the only TV device they use. Maybe Google didn't do a good enough job to simplify everything and make it uh, better and, and convince these companies to use it. I, I, I think they were afraid to lose uh, profits, I, I, uh, what's I, called a revenue share. I, I, th I think that what happened with Google is that they created something that was too complex. Um, and the TV is a very different device. You know, when did your TV last crash? Yeah, and, and you don't need all this extra featuring on it a lot of the times. The compelling value proposition of TV is long-form video. If you look at app usage on TV, the only thing consumers use is long-form video. Um, and all this other stuff that's in Android, you don't really need, but it all adds complexity, and that complexity adds unreliability, and also adds to hardware cost. Um, and as a result, Android is very greedy on memory, um, 
and normally people find that they get issues with slow running and they solve it by adding more memory to their designs, but that's all cost. Um, and, and that comes back to this you know, extra weight of the complexity. All right, cool, but uh, I mean, we can't keep running. We have to see what's going yeah, on yeah. in there, right? The Pepcom. Absolutely. And it's going to be very busy CES, right? The most busy ever. Um, is that what you've been told? I don't know. That's, that's what I imagine. Every year it grows, right? Uh, every year they, it grows and every year it changes. So I was on the monorail and I saw, it seems like the wind has a whole bunch of holes now. Uh, it, it's more and more about you know, technology and software and especially automotive now. Um, so you know, the days of 10 or 15 years ago when it was brown goods are long gone. Um, the risk is, I think, that many retailers, um, as a result, find it less interesting because you, know, you can't sell car autonomy software to consumers. So you know, the show evolves and, and that's in line with, with how the business evolves. Um, and, and I think consumer electronics show is changing into, just like the name of the parent organization, consumer technology. And maybe not even consumer technology. I, I don't know whether an autonomous car is really a consumer technology or actually a B2B technology. Um, it's for Uber which to buy those. Yeah, you know, and, and that Mercedes and BMW are buying this technology, not, not us as consumers. Um, and, and is that really consumer facing? I'm not sure. But also, just one last thing, yeah. uh, the DLP, I think it's fascinating doing this trick for doing the 4K. But uh, they, they claim it's HDR, but it's it's projection. But you can't really do HDR with a projector, right? Um, I don't know. Is the answer? I, I'm, I've got some demos booked to have a look at. Um, I think in general the, the the problem that projectors always have is contrast reserve. Um, so the black is as black as the screen of the projector. If you watch it in the dark, that's fine. If you're watching it in normal ambient light, then you can't have blacker than you the wall. You can't project black. Uh, you can't project, nobody's yet invented black light. Uh, okay. And, and that's, that's the problem that projectors are always fighting. All right, but uh, if, if that's, that would be a way to see all the pixels. If you have a huge 150 inch, that's the way to see the 4K pixels, from, even from far certainly, away. Certainly on all these ones, you have to sit a certain fraction of the screen height, as, you know, away from it. And for 4K, you need to sit at around one and a half times the height of the screen. The further away, you can't see it. Yeah, that's just the human eye. You know, we're not eagles. Um, and if it's 8K, then you need to sit at 0.75 times the height of the screen. If you're further away, you can, you're not seeing all the, all the all the information that's there. Oh. So you need a really huge 8K display. You need you, for 8K, you need either a very big display or to be very close to it. Or use it for like a, uh, like a museum. Could be a fantastic monitor uh, <laughs> format, you know, 55 inch 8K, which is going to be a fantastic desktop monitor format. Like a gallery. Yeah. I want to see my slideshows on there and come yeah. up to the family pictures up close. Yeah, and then, then it's about realism again. Right. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, Thanks. my pleasure, Nicholas. Thanks.